Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming back to the forum stage. It's fabulous to have you here. My name is Kerry Finch. I run a reputation management company called Finch Factor. I am also proud to be the Cannes Lions representative for the Netherlands. So if there are any Dutchies in the audience, woohoo! Hello, welcome. Who is it? Fine om jullie te zien. Ongelooflijk niet te geloven. Okay, that's my Dutch done. Um, I uh, will be introducing WCRS in just a moment. I'm very, very excited about this presentation. I have seen it. It rocks. It kicks ass. Before that, we want to make sure that we as an audience, as a collection of human beings, can ask questions to our speaker. And I would like you to uh, get your phones into your hands, please, and type in glsr.it forward slash forum2. If it's the first time you've ever done this, please log in, and then you are done for the day. What this means is you can type in your questions. You will you will be able to vote on other people's questions. They will rise to the top. At the end of our session, I will be posing and curating those questions, and we will have an interesting backwards and forwards. This is how we get you folks involved. It's very good fun. glsr.it forward slash forum two. Are we there? Are we done? Are we happy? Oh, you're so sweet. Not. Okay, so um, I am very excited to be welcoming the uh, today's best shirt of the day. Uh, it is being worn by Dino Burbage, who tells me he's an expert on neuroscience. Uh, so don't forget to ask really difficult questions at the end. Uh, please welcome G, uh, Dino uh, from WCRS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I need the clicker. That might help, right? OK. Um, this is going to be quick, so um, if you're taking notes, I apologise. Uh, so first thing, I am not a neuroscientist, so really go easy on me. If there's any neuroscientists in the audience, please don't ask questions at the end. This is, that's for everybody else. Um, so uh, this is my journey. So uh, this is where I work. Um, I have some friends in the room. This is WCRS in, in London. And I turned up one day, and there was an email, uh, essentially, from uh, this guy. Uh, and this is Michael Bannessy, uh, and he's... He's from Goldsmiths University. He's on a quest to find the, how to boost creativity. And he was going around to Europe, uh, basically putting electricity through people's heads to try and find out how to boost uh, electricity and creativity. So this was his technique. It's the transcranial, uh, I'm going to stand over here because this, this is easier to read, uh, transcranial alternating current stimulation device, uh, which basically means transcranial means across the head, alternating current, which means electricity, and stimulation, which means vibes and stuff. I'll talk about it later. Um, so let's do this. This is me wearing the actual device. Um, and that's just pretty much just like, let's do it. Brilliant. Yes, reply. Um, so first of all, what is creativity? It's a bit of a butterfly. Nobody really knows what it is. But I found this quote. And there's one word in this I'd like to just knuckle down on, which is creativity is an activity that involves thinking that is aimed at producing ideas or products that are relatively novel. That's the word we need. Uh, and that are in some way, in respect, compelling. So that's great and everything. But how do you measure creativity? It's like you can't measure it, right? Well, it turns out you can. And this is widely known how you measure creativity. Oh, a laser, look. Uh, here we go. Where's the laser? Look at that. Um, so you start with imitation. So you just copy something. You go and make a variation of it. You make a combination of it. You join something together. You move it to the next level. Maybe you transform it. You use it for something it's not supposed to do. And then finally is the Holy Grail, which is the original creation. So you can mark things essentially from kind of one to five up that scale. Uh, and there are two types of creativity as well. There's convergent thinking and divergent thinking. So convergent thinking is you're trying to solve a problem. You're trying to converge on a, on a solution. So what do you do with a carrot and a coin? Come up with a solution with a carrot and coin. That's convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is traditionally creative thinking. Come up with as many ideas as you can. So in this case, that was a task we were given. So wear this funny hat and come up with as many uh, uses for a paperclip as you can. And they were scored on that scale we've seen before. So if you went through that scale, you'd say, well, holding paper together, right, I've, just, I've not done anything there. And then maybe holding cloth together. Oh, I've, I've branched out a bit. Uh, using it to pick a lock, maybe a coat hanger for a mouse, stamming a beetle in the eye, and then or maybe it's a symbol for pizza on the plastic tantooine. You know, you're getting up that spectrum. You know, there's ones over in that corner, and there's sort of fours in this corner. So you can start scoring it. So it was a two-week thing. Uh, the first week, had it, electricity. It made my eye go a little bit funny. It was quite interesting. 
Uh, came up with some ideas. It was interesting. You know, thought it was on fire. You know, more creative, unicorns and things. Second week was amazing. Just could not stop the ideas coming out. So then the results came through, uh, and my mind was blown. So clearly, the second week was when I had the uh, electricity. Only it wasn't. It was the first week. So I was like, hang on, what's going on there? So you didn't boost my, my creativity at all. And it turns out that people who, who are already creative have no benefit from this test. People who are not creative are boosted by 10%. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's good for me, because it kind of slightly proves I'm creative. But disappointing that I didn't get any benefit. So I thought, but if you're not creative, you're 10% more creative. So what else can we apply this to? So I thought, well, you know, how, how deep does a rabbit hole go? I need to know more about this. So that's what set me on this, this journey. Um, which is what I'm going to then talk you through. There's a lot of slides. I'm not going to, I'm going to keep going like this, so I do apologise. Um, I couldn't take any of them out because they're all interesting. So what does a super creative look like? What can you do? What do you do to be more creative? So I've organised it into four Bs. So there's the, the background. So where do you live? Where do you come from? Your genetics. Uh, your behaviour. So what can you do? What can you start to change? But the things you do every day. And then your body. So what do you eat? Uh, maybe what you can augment your body with. And then we go to the interesting bit, which is the brain, the neuroscience of the brain and creativity. So let's start with background. Um, it turns out that if you take the creative, uh, uh, the gross domestic product from each country, so how much they actually earn from the creative services, and you divide it by the amount of people in that country, it turns out Iceland have got the most creative people uh, of any country in the world. Uh, and then Luxembourg, the UK, Malta, and Switzerland. So on average, if you were born in Iceland, you will be on average more creative than any other race. Uh, also, where you were, when you went to school, uh, schooling is quite tricky because a lot, of pe a lot of countries can't get creative training right. They can't, they can't score it very well, so therefore they tend to back off. Whereas the UK, in this order, the UK, uh, America and Italy have the most people who have graduated in the creative arts. Uh, completely bizarrely, that if you are surrounded by exactly this colour, which is a sort of a mid-pine green, if you're staring at that colour, you are more likely to be creative when you are actually staring at that colour. So if you're born around grey, that's not going to be so great. If you're born around green, then that's even better. So definitely stare at green. You can get wallpaper that does it as well, by the way. Genetics, there is a creative gene. So this is a study. By the way, all of this has got scientific stuff behind it. If you're interested in it, come and see me. I'll, I'll give you a link to every single one of these slides. Uh, they've done a study of five uh, uh, generations of musicians. And they, what they found is a, a genetic defect in every single generation of musicians in that family. So essentially, they found a... Uh, a musician's gene. And it's a mutation, so it's not just like it just, they've just found it and everybody's got them. It's a definite mutation. So there is a creative gene. Um, slightly controversially, bipolar and schizophrenia, you are more likely, you over-index in the creative industries if you have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So the way this sort of works, and this is very complicated, I'm just going to gloss over it a little bit, if I may. Um, but there are parts of your brain that work together, and if the part that's trying to control your brain backs off a little bit. It frees your mind to be a bit more fun. And that's pretty much what's happening in bipolar disease. Very, very simple version of it. Um, so brain sync. So you've probably been told to hang around successful people. Absolutely true. Another study actually put EEG devices on uh, school students. And the longer they spent together around each other, uh, the more they would uh, think together alike. So this gives a little bit of credence to you should probably be in a creative team. Should your creatives sit together in an agency? Absolutely, they should. So stick together with creatives. Now we move on to behavior. So these are, you can start to sort of change these bits a little bit. So the whole point about behavior is you're trying to free up the frontal lobe. And again, any neuroscientist in the room, I do apologize. This is a gross simplicity. But the frontal lobe is where the fun happens. And there's a bit over here that is where the sort of the boring stuff happens. It's, it's the interplay between these two bits. You need to just chill out a little bit between them. So you need to tell the temporal lobe just to back off so the frontal lobe can have a bit more fun. Um, so there are easy ways of doing it. You can go for a walk. Uh, there are basically chemicals that your body produces during exercising, meditation, etc. Or you can just go and have a warm bath. Uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, don't do the two together. Uh, people who are open, again, are more likely to be creative. If you are open to ideas or experiences, then you over-index in the creative scale. So if you're not open to uh, experiences, then clearly you will not have as many things to reference in your brain later on. So those experiences become useful. I'll explain that later. Uh, swearing, uh, again, there are studies on all of this. The only reason any slide is in here is because there's a scientific study behind it. 
Uh, if you are creative, you are 16% more likely to swear. Uh, likewise, if you're, a, if you're a woman, you are more likely to swear with your friends. Uh, if you are a man, you are more likely to swear at work, but you will, are always more likely to swear if you're creative. Lists, who'd have thought? Uh, lists are usually what you think uh, sort of boring people do, but there are two types of lists. They're really interesting. Both are really useful for, for creatives. There's an ordered list, so stuff that you've got in your brain, you just need to get out of your brain. The way that works is it leaves your brain space to do other things, to think, to be creative. And then there are unordered lists, there are random lists. So, you know, you could put in there a, a ladybird or, uh, you know, a car, uh, some cheese. Put a list of really random things. Your brain gets trained in making random jumps and random associations. So it's actually sort of brain training technique. Uh, stress. So the stress hormones, uh, so cortisol, uh, adrenaline, uh, lots of things with ilin at the end of them. Um, so this works with, if you, if you don't have a stress, then actually your flight or fight response is quite useful for creativity. It puts you on task. So if you have something that is a bit stressful, you'll be more productive than if you've got no stress whatsoever. If you go too far on this spectrum, then your, your, your cortisol starts to actually affect your immune system. You, you start to become ill. So too much stress over too long a period is bad for you, but just enough in right periods is actually useful for productivity. Again, I'm not kidding you, there's a scientific study about this. If you stare at an Apple logo, just the amount, same amount of time as an IBM logo, directly afterwards you will be more creative. And these, these, are, the, these are the bar charts here. Uh, that is absolutely true. Uh, Music, so we all know that if you want to create a baby, you play uh, you know, classical music whilst you're pregnant. There is actually truth behind that. So, so again, on all the tests of creativity, if, you, if it turns out any music is good. As long as you like the music, that's the right music for you. As long as it's relatively pacey, so sort of Justin Timberlake, Miley Cyrus sort of beat, uh, and it needs to be relatively loud, so about a washing machine on its, uh, on its spin cycle, and it turns out actually any sound is good as well. It just basically allows your mind to wander. But music is good. Uh, and then we move on to the body. Um, things you can do are really easy. So we've got, um, uh, is it tyrosine, I think, is uh, produced by fruit. Um, if you like walnuts, that's good. You've got omega-3s in walnuts. Uh, chocolate, I mean, these are all good, right? There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing bad in this. Uh, so you've got chocolate, you've got flavanols in there, uh, you've got carbohydrates, so yes, that does mean biscuits and cakes and pasta, uh, and then alcohol, but just below the legal driving limit, so you don't want anything too bad because your, your judgment will become impaired and you think the ideas are better than they are, and we'll meet that concept a little bit later on. Uh, this is fundamental, so hydration. Um, hydration is super important. A 1% drop in hydration gives you a 12% drop in productivity. So just to give you an idea, 80% of the US workforce are underhydrated. So even if you just are hydrated, you're in the top 20% of a country's productive workforce. And to give you another example, 3% dehydration gives you five times more likely to crash a car. And that puts you in the same space as over the drink drive limit in most European and worldwide countries. That puts you well over the drink drive limit in France, by the way. Just that stat. Um, napping, so you've heard, I'm just going to have a quick creative nap, a power nap, that's actually a thing. Uh, so seven to ten minutes is the optimum nap. Now the way this works is, when you feel sleepy, you can have a sleep, that's fine. But when you wake up, you will be a bit groggy if you wake up too early. It's what's called sleep inertia. So the idea is, is to have a nap, get into the point where your body thinks you're sleeping, and then wake up as soon as you possibly can, before the chemicals have had a chance to sort of tell you that you're really sleeping. Seven to ten minutes is actually where that happens. And there's a natural rhythm that you, you sort of fight during the day. So one is what's called the sleep drive, and that sleep drive gets more and more and more towards the evening. Your sleep drive is so high, you have to sleep. And then you have what's called an arousal drive, which is you wake up and you, kind of, you start to get excited by the day, and then during the evening you start to peak a little bit. When those two things are at their sort of the, their peaks, that's when you should sleep. So that's your, that's your ultimate time. So how do you find when that time is? Well, there are sleep pods that you can go into these sleep pods, have a quick nap, and it will then sort of detect when you're going into that state, and it will wake you up in a way that you will not have sleep inertia. Uh, your gut instinct, I find this fascinating. So you do actually have neurons in your digestive system. No, you don't have one or two of them. You have 100 million of them. So you have the same amount of neurons in your digestive system as a hamster has in its entire head. Um, so that thing where a creator will go, I don't know, I just had a gut feeling it felt right, is absolutely a thing. You actually have a brain, essentially, in your digestive system. And you have 95% of your serotonin gets released into your, into your uh, digestive system, so they're the happiness drug. So when you feel you've got a good idea and you have butterflies, 
and then you have, you have a bad idea and you get a knot in your stomach. That's actually the crossover between this kind of ancient stomach brain and your kind of more cerebral brain talking to each other. So should you trust your gut instinct? Yes, you should. Um, so that's the, the sort of senses you have are all well and good, but what happens if you're born without a sense and you need to get it back? So there are ways of augmenting the body with extra senses. So this is Neil Harrison, who is, is colorblind. He can't just not see blue and green or yellow or whatever it is. He can't see anything that is color. So he gets complete gray vision. So he's invented this device with a camera on the front of it. It points it at colors and it turns the color into sound. So he hears the color of things. So he can hear what red sounds like and he can hear what blue sounds like. But interestingly, he can therefore hear what infrared sounds like, and he can hear what ultraviolet sounds like, and x-rays. So he can actually see more than we can, or he can hear more than we can see, if you see what I mean. So you can then start augmenting your body to have more senses, to have more input, to be more creative. And you can take that one step further. You can have data that inputs into your body. So this is um, Moon Rebus, who's a performance artist, and she has um, basically devices that can, can detect uh, earthquakes around the world. And they can be minor tremors or they can be full-on earthquakes. Um, but every time one happens around the world, doesn't matter where it is, she will feel them in her body. And she will use it in her performance art uh, to, to invoke dances or whatever she's doing. So you can actually start to use data to give you more senses to be more creative. Uh, and this is an experiment that Facebook have released recently uh, where you can actually talk through your skin or you can listen, you can understand through your skin. And just to explain it, this lady here has a, uh, a sleeve which has sort of mini vibrating sort of speakers in there. And the guy on the left-hand side has typed into his iPad, pick up the white sphere, and it's made little vibrations in her skin, and she's understood it, picked up the white sphere. So if you're in a meeting room, and everybody else is just using their sight and their hearing and their normal senses, and you have this complete extra sense that you can then start communicating with, uh, that's quite an interesting thing. Then we move on to the really interesting bit, which is the brain. So this is the last bit. Uh, and then there's a paradox in neuroscience, which is this. So if the human brain was so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple we couldn't. So if you got, you're like a, I don't know, like a fruit fly, it's got a very simple brain, uh, we could probably just about understand a fruit fly's brain, but then we'd be a fruit fly and we wouldn't be able to make an MRI scanner to understand the brain. So we don't understand it is the main point of this. Not only do we not understand it, that left brain, right brain thing, stop doing that, that's not a thing. And also, we're not just using 10% of our brain. We just don't really understand what the other 90 is used for. So stop all of that. That's basically the, what I'll take away from that. Um, and again, sorry for the neuroscientists. I'm going to oversimplify this by putting emojis uh, on the brain. Um, but this is roughly how the brain is built. Uh, you have a really old bit it's called the cerebellum. Uh, that's your sort of, you've just crawled out of the swamp and you need to survive. So you, all the involuntary things, like you need to breathe, you need to have an immune system, you probably need to uh, wince away from light or something like that. So the involuntary things, you need to blink, those things that we can't control. Then you have the limbic system, which is built on top of that, which is slightly more modern, that's the mammal bit. Uh, so that's the things like, uh, I might need to have sex to reproduce, uh, uh, if somebody threatens me, I might need to puff up and look angry, or I might need to run away. You know, what we call animal instinct. Uh, and then we have the, the, the fun bit on the outside, the red bit, uh, which is the more modern bit, so that's the cortex. That, that makes us think and makes us have thoughts and creativity and language. Uh, so digging into that one a little bit more, uh, again, this is a gross simplification of the brain, but essentially you have the fun bit at the front, uh, <laughs> and then down here is the boring bit. This is where your memory and your logic resides down here, and it's this interplay, I'd say, that between these two that um, like squabbling children, re really. Uh, and then you have a parietal lobe up here, which is where your senses happen. Uh, and then occipital lobe down here, which is where your visual cortex is. So your eyes go essentially straight through your brain and connect to the back. Um, it seems like a strange way of doing it, but that's how it works. Um, now, working memory seems like a simple thing. It doesn't really seem that useful for creativity, but it, it turns out it's really useful for creativity. So if you have a high working memory, so uh, a low working memory will only have a certain amount of data points in it. You haven't got a huge amount of experiences. And likewise, the points in between, the roads in between those experiences are not very thick. So you find it hard to remember. Somebody who has a high working memory has a lot of things in their head. And not only that, is they've exercised those routes quite a lot, and they find it really easy to jump between those points. So what you're trying to do is train the memory to not only have a lot of things in it, but also have very good quality uh, roads between each one of those points. So there are four things you can do uh, I'd recommend. So com reading comprehension. So people who read quickly, good on you. I'm not one of them. Um, but reading comprehension is read something, commit it to memory. 
read something, commit it to memory. Not just read, actually think about it and commit it to memory. Uh, there's these things called dual NBAC games. If you want to download an app on your phone, you can do that. They're quite hard to explain, but essentially you, it's a, like rounds of a game. Uh, and what the rules for one are based on what happened in the last game. So for instance, if your, your round is red and the last round was red, then that's true, it's a winner. If you go on to the next round, it's green. Well, the last round was red, that they're different. So you go back to the last round for the rules for this round. So that's how many backs you go. So one back is quite easy to do. If you go two back, it's even more interesting. Three backs really difficult. But you can train your memory to actually go back into time to actually get the rules. Uh, sleep quality, so if you, you know, your day is great, and when you sleep, you take it from short-term memory into long-term memory, and it lays it down into sort of good quality memories. So good quality sleep is important, and the low side technique um, is what memory masters use, uh, and you can learn it, which is everything you learn, you actually have a visual place in your mind, like a, a mansion or a shopping center, and when somebody says something new, you know exactly what room it goes in, and you traverse this room in your mind, and you put it in there, and you say it three times. But there is a, there's a mind memory technique that will allow you to not only put more things in your brain, but also strengthen the links between them. Now, your brain obviously lies to you. So there's a bunch of people in this room who see a wall on that side. Good on you. Uh, there's nothing strange about that wall. And on this side, somebody probably is looking at a fly or uh, a drawing of a, some sort of, I don't know, locust or something like that. And what's happening there, and other people can see something else on those ones, by the way. So what's happening there is 20% of what you see is not actually what you see. It's your brain trying to hijack it and go, look, I'm going to save you a little bit of time here. Uh, I, I think I know what this is. Just, just take it from me. And then your brain goes, OK, cool, and carries on. So 20% or up to 20% of what you see is not actually what your eyes are actually perceiving. So if we see that one again, then uh, can everybody see the cigar sticking out the wall? I was like, I'm not really sure, what's he talking about? Uh, and then this one is a cowboy lit from this side, a big Stetson hat on, this is his mouth just here, and there's a nose and an eye. And, you know, it's not a wasp. But now you've seen it, when I go back, and I go, oh, let's go back a slide, so what's on this slide? You go, well, it's a cigar sticking out of a wall. Because you've seen it once, your brain goes, I know what it is, I'll jump in and help you out on this one, it works again. You'll never unsee it once you've seen it. So people, some people see things, some people don't. Um, drugs, let's talk about that one. So cocaine and weed specifically. Um, it's a complete um, misnomer, this one. So if you, are, if you take weed, for instance, this is a placebo level. Um, so this is, this is not weed, it's probably hemp. You're smoking it, it smells the same, but probably isn't. You take a little bit of weed, depending on what study you take, it's either up or down on the creative scale, but it's statistically insignificant. If you take a lot of weed, and then you try somebody in their, those creative tests, all of a sudden it's way down. You think you're brilliant, but you're not actually brilliant on the actual scale. Same with cocaine as well, and alcohol. So don't take weed, guys. There are some drugs that you think you should take when you're doing tests. So this is uh, modphenil or uh, modalert. There are other names for it. So this is kind of a study drug. Take this before you do your exams. Uh, now, it turns out it might work if you're in this top corner over here. But for everybody else, creativity drops on this drug. So if you are a high creative person, uh, so you're, you know, you're a designer or something like that, it doesn't matter what you're doing, conversion or diversion thinking, it will be bad for you. It will make you more logical, less creative. Uh, if you're a low creative person trying to do divergent thinking, same thing. The only time it'll help is in this top corner. If you're trying to do convergent thinking and you're not creative, go for it. So it's not the be all and end all to take these kind of performance enhancing drugs. Uh, and it gets even worse than that, that it actually nullifies cocaine. But it does work if you're a creative, if you're sleep deprived. So there's a very simple chart so that if you want to figure out whether you need to do it, uh, it's pretty much nope most of the time. And yes, only if you're not creative and you want to do problem solving or you're sleep deprived. Um, some people have accidents and wake up creative, super creative. They're savants. So a savant is somebody who's super creative to the genius level. Uh, you get savant mathematicians. You can have savant uh, painters, musicians. Now, the way this works is uh, if somebody's had a bang on the head, and it's usually in this front quarter here, um, what you do is you get this beautiful term, which is called paradoxical functional facilitation. And essentially, it's the brain going, well, sod this, I'm off to the back. This is quite dangerous over here. And at the back is where the optical cortex is. And it tends to put more activity in the optical cortex in some people for the right accident. So your occipital lobe can actually get more activity in it. So people can see something and then go, right, I've got it. I can just see it and I can paint it absolutely precisely. And we perceive those people as creative geniuses, but it might just be through a head injury, as uh, simple as that. Uh, and then we come all the way through to me wearing this uh, beautiful headset here. 
Uh, and the way this works is it tries, when you think creatively, we've actually measured the, basically the vibrations in your head. Your head goes into a hum, the alpha hum, and that's only at about 10 hertz. That's a very, very low frequency. So the idea would be, if you then took some electricity and then you vibrated the head at the same frequency, could it set your head into that frequency? Uh, and the answer is yes. If you're non-creative, it has a great effect. If you're creative, it has no effect. But also, depending on where you put the electricity in, you can promote divergent on, or convergent thinking. And this is what the CREAM study was all about. So um, it was good to be part of it. Um, kept, in, kept in touch with those guys. And I'm sort of, there'll be more experiments coming. If you want to be part of it, you can sign up to it. Um, then implanting memories. So you've got the memories you've got. How could you borrow somebody else's? So this is an experiment with rats. It's very well reported. You take a rat, you take it out of its nice little room, and you put it in a, dark, a black room, and you electrify it a little bit so it doesn't like the black room. It goes, I don't like the black room. You, you look at its brain. You can see the neurons that are being fired when it didn't like that room. You get another rat, and you pour some, um, some light-sensitive dye into its brain, and then you use a light just to use the same neurons. You flush them at the neurons, and it builds those neurons up in the other, brat, in other rat. So in theory, it's got the same neurons as the first rat. You put the second rat in the black room, it does not like the black room. It's never been there before, but it's got a memory from another rat about that room. And likewise, you take them both out, squirt them with the thing, give them some more light, you take the neurons away, uh, the, the pathways away, you put them back in the black room, they're chilled out in the black room. So you can both promote and take away memories. So if you could borrow the memories of any artist or anybody you've ever met, you could borrow their memories and put them into your own head, that's now possible. And if you want something slightly more immediate, this is, uh, this is transfer of actual thinking real time. So this rat on the left-hand side has been trained to do what's like a degree for a rat. So the lights that come on in his little feeding pen, there's like a left right and a right right, a right light, and then you have to then tap your nose on something and wait for a bit and wait for the other light to come on. It's quite a complicated thing. It takes months for the rat to learn this sequence to get the treat. Uh, and then what you do is, you, unfortunately, the rat gets it again. Uh, you stick some wires into the rat's brain, and you wire them directly to the other rat, who's never met this task before, and all of a sudden, this rat can do it straight away. So all of a sudden, that matrix thing where you want to know kung fu, or you want to know how to fight, or whatever it is, that's now available. So if your creative director or ECD turns up, and you all basically just plug into your ECD, uh, then that's now possible. You can then borrow off their intelligence. And therefore, you can borrow off anything. So why not the world? Why not artificial intelligence? Why not machine learning? Um, so mind melding with the internet is, is possible. Um, and if that doesn't work for you, this is the last one of these slides, by the way. It gets no creepier than this. Uh, the world's first head transplant is scheduled to go ahead this year. So it was supposed to be in Russia. Uh, it's now been transferred into China. So keep a lookout for the Twitter sphere, sort of about November, December. They're going for the world's first head transplant. So if your head's not doing it for you, then just get somebody else's. So in conclusion, uh, how am I doing for time? A little bit over. Uh, no, that's good, right? Um, so in conclusion, um, you should be born in Iceland. You should have creative parents, uh, creative mates, schooled in the UK. You should be well-traveled, foul-mouthed, chilled, love music, uh, body mods. You should be intuitive, well-rested. You should like cakes, pasta, etc. Have a good memory, ideally not on drugs, brain implants. Be brilliant if you're accident-prone as well. Uh, ideally something that will cause uh, front uh, trauma. Uh, maybe kickboxing or mountain biking would be advisable. Um, so I thought a bit of fun, I'll try and find this person. So who, if I had a tick list of everything you should possibly do, which is pretty much that, who could I get into this tick list? Um, Iceland was proving a problem, as was the brain injury. Um, so I thought I'd go from those extremes. So clearly, Bjork is going to be up in that list. Uh, she scores a, a pretty good 11 out of 16. Um, she's pretty chilled. Uh, she doesn't have any brain plants, not accident prone as far as I know. Uh, her parents weren't creative. Uh, so taking away the Iceland thing, which was a bit limiting, uh, Ozzy Osbourne's actually up there as well. He's only one point, one point behind, just because he's accident prone and he's had a pretty decent head injury. Uh, <laughs> and he also swears quite a lot, um, so that's kind of useful. His parents weren't creative either, interestingly. And I did what anybody else would do, is I googled it as well. So this is the most bizarre slide I've probably got. Um, so I googled the most creative person in the world, and Elizabeth Grace Saunders comes up. Um, so I found out a little bit, I mean, this is creepy because I had to stalk her for a little bit just to see who she was. Um, but she's a life coach in America, and she teaches people just to unplug from their work, everyday life, and just chill out a bit more. Uh, so she's the most creative person in the world. I don't think she knows. I'm probably going to have to email her and just tell her that. Um, but she's in front of David Droger from Droger 5, for God's sake. So that's amazing. Um, I don't think they know that. But, you know, respectable 9 out of 16. Um, 
However, you know, you know what all these rules are now, so there's a lot of things you can do in there. So really, it could be you. So you need to go away and have a try of these two things. If I told you to do one thing, it would be drink more water. That's pretty much it. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dino. I think we should hashtag Elizabeth Grace Saunders. <laughs> freak and her out, uh, yeah. everybody tweet her right now. And let's see. Let's see if we can find her and bring her to Cannes. Um, we have quite a lot of questions. You've been making everybody's uh, brains buzz. Are you born with creativity or can you learn it? What's your thinking on that one? Um, I, uh, you definitely learn it. Uh, I don't think you're... My, my parents weren't creative, for instance. I'm from a farming background, so... Uh, not particularly creative. I think you can learn it, you've got to have a passion. I think it's a little bit like innovation. I think knowledge will lead to it the more you know uh, and the more you're immersed by it. So uh, it's definitely nurture, not, not nature. Okay. And can you explain the blue versus white dress scenario? Do you remember that? Yeah, so, uh, yes, that I do remember of, it. That's a bit of neuroscience right there. Yeah, so it's basically about ambient light, that one. So depending on uh, what light you're currently in, uh, it will then make blue, for instance, seem white. Because if you're in super blue light, white, uh, a, a lighter blue will seem white. So basically that whole red, uh, sorry, gold versus blue thing uh, is actually just about ambient light. Very good. Okay, so um, <laughs> thoughts on legalising weed and go. Thoughts on legalising weed. Um, all I'll say is uh, recreational weed, well, legalising it or decriminalising it are two different things. So decriminalising it is probably actually the term because a lot of countries it used to be completely normal, as were opiates and all sorts of things. So it's decriminalising rather than legalising. Um, and I would say recreational use, no, no points. Uh, I can't really have a, a comment on that. Um, but I would say, just like alcohol, you know, it might have that effect just up to a limit. Um, but legally, I can't condone that. <laughs> Beautifully sidestepped. Um, how can marketeers exploit neuroscience breakthroughs? Because a lot of agencies these days um, have uh, started talking about neuroscience and, uh, well, f in all sorts of different ways, but it's suddenly become sort of tr trendy in some way to plug it into, into strategy and creative thinking. What's your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I think neuroscience in advertising, I think, is um, short term for actually listening. Um, so... Uh, you hear about it a lot in Out of Home where they, they've done neuro neuroscience research and all they've really done is they've seen whether people actually look at stuff or not and smile or not. So, and then they'll show them things and say they'll have a little cranial cap on an EEG device and then they'll say when I showed you picture one or picture two, did, it be, did you have more blood flow in certain parts of your head? So it's very, very crude. I think the interesting thing is machine learning. So uh, machine learning, one of the brilliant parts about machine learning is you can chuck in so much data that it can start finding things that we wouldn't even look at. So these little signals, as they're called. Um, so I think it's behavior-based, and that's what, pe that's what neuro neuroscience is. So I think machine learning will be able to pick up on how people are reacting to things much more finely than we can. For a non-neuroscientist, you're doing very well. Um, would you technically be two people in one body if you implant all of someone else's memories? Uh, yeah, so this is an interesting one. So you could take this a, a couple of ways, but my, my, the interesting thing is if you want to be immortal. So I think immortality is part of that as well. If you could just increase, you increase your thoughts forever. Um, so immortality is currently thought of as being chemical, so what do you drink, eat, drink, or whatever. Um, but if you could then take your memories, record them, and stick them into something else that is essentially you. So imagine having a stem cell scrape when you're three years old, and they keep making versions of you every, every five years. So there's always a version of you five years. Uh, and then basically you say, right, actually, my body's getting old. I need to now transfer me into one of my new me's, my perfect me's. Uh, they can transfer your memories, because we know how to implant memories now. They transfer your memories into one of the new yous. Uh, you probably spend a week on holiday with it just to make sure it's got all the right things. Uh, you ask all the tricky questions. And then when you're happy with it, you go into essentially a mulcher. And then the new you is, is you. So um, I think, it, yeah, I think if you have uh, the ability to transfer and store memories, I think that will be essentially immortality. OK, so it's the future, people. Is the future people, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the future. This oh, is it, oh, it's definitely, happen. yeah. I mean, I, I was in a, I thought it was quite interesting is uh, there's quite a lot of talk about uh, will AI take over humans and uh, are they plugging into our brains and taking over our thinking? Uh, and there were, there were 
Two, two things I thought were interesting is uh, I had an audience with Gary Kasparov, of all people, the, the chess champion, uh, and when asked, or somebody asked, um, uh, how do you prepare uh, to take on a computer and you're just a human? Uh, he said, well, you prepare with a hammer. I thought that was quite interesting. So the human will always, will always be there or thereabouts. Uh, and there's a, um, I can't remember what the rule is, it's like the, the budding rule or the binding rule or something like that, where the guy who invented the lawnmower uh, basically said, I've just invented the lawnmower, was a bit sheepish about it, and then lawnmowers led to flat grass, which led to professional sports, which led to sports people, which coaches, stadiums, sponsorship, TV rights. So you never quite know what's just around the corner. We're dealing with neuroscience with today's knowledge, but three days' time, a month's time, there might be a brand new thing that comes out that all of a sudden we're in a whole different thing, gives humans a brand new lease of life again. So. Um, you know, currently what we're doing, I think we're, we're, we're evil, we're not, you know, there's no, there's no sort of star net or there's no sort of uh, AI going to kill us just yet. What about uh, a skill or a memory that you would like to implant into your mind? What would that be? Bizarrely, um, memory, I think that would be it. Um, uh, you can probably tell from this, I just, I'm fascinated by everything. I could probably go off on an entire thing about engines or turbochargers or superchargers. I, you know, my brain does not stop. I don't sleep enough. Uh, and people's names are just, just like little butterflies in my mind. So if there's one thing I could do, it would actually take notice of what I've actually said today. Drink more and memorise more. Drink more water. Let's yes, be drink more water, yeah. Rosé. Okay, just hashtag drink more water. Yeah. Uh, what is creativity worth if you can download it to your brain? Um, well, I think that the whole point is that creativity keeps moving. So I think if, if everybody likes the same thing and you go, well, everybody comes up with the same thing because they've got access to everything, then that sort of, there's nothing unique anymore. And people love, no, you know, the word right at the beginning is novel, you know. Um, if everybody had access to the same thing, it would be the person who were different, would stand out. So, you know, I think you could say if you had access to everything, it would be people who knew nothing would stand out. So there's always a good part to it. And um, here's a question right at the top. When we shift from hardware to humanware, will creativity need to drive emotional takeout even more? What the hell does that mean? Oh, you don't get it. Hardware I to don't humor. get it. No. When we shift from <laughs> hardware to humanware, will creativity... Should we say yes? Um, let's say, um, yeah. Yes. That will totally, totally happen. A solid yes yeah. there. Um, Is that the right answer? I don't know. Uh, it's obviously clearly <laughs> the right answer because you've, you've chosen it. I do apologise. Uh, should we finish on this one? What creature do you think has the most... Com well, I mean, I'm sure there's a fact factual answer to this. Is there a creature that has the most complex brain? Um, is there a creature that has the most complex brain? I and mean, we were bound to say us though, right? Um, I'd like to say it's a, it, it's a dog. It's a dog? Yeah, just randomly. There's no science behind that. I is just, there a specific dog you're thinking of? I just really like dogs. I think they're really smart. <laughs> a specific breed, perhaps? Yeah. Or is there one you know? Uh, Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retrieve is quite smart. You know, they can go into woods, find a ball that I'd left there two weeks ago. They seem quite smart. I can't do that. So, I, have no, I don't know, basically, is the answer. But uh, dogs or cats. OK, and, and we, let's... Uh, Although I do, was... I do have an interesting fact. that There was an experiment once which figured out at what point does an animal not can't change its brain to save its life, which I thought was quite interesting. And the chickens was where they ended up. So they put um, prisms on the chicken's eyes, uh, little goggles, little leather goggles. Uh, and what they did is they put seed so that the chicken essentially would go, oh, it's seed, and it would always peck off to the, the side. And it could never correct its brain state to feed itself. Uh, and everything above that could. Like, we can put glasses on that rotate and do all sorts of things, and we'll eventually get it. And eventually they just figured out chickens are pretty much anything below chickens are stupid and they can't actually change their brain state to save their lives. Um, yeah. OK, don't, don't be a chicken. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's end on this question. Uh, how many people do you think is optimal in a creative process? Um, I, I, I used to work in a not uh, a creative agency um, so actually, that's not, not advertising agency. So creative teams weren't a thing. Mm. Uh, and since I've seen creative teams working, I think that that interplay between the two creatives is, is really interesting. But I think it's when somebody has uh, the openness to ask other people around them uh, and to, to bend on it. Uh, I think creatives should absolutely stay. You know, when they've got a good idea, it's a good idea, and everybody else will then go, "Bloody, that's a good idea. Well done." Uh, 
And I think when the, you know it's not a good idea, you kind of need to open it up a little bit. So I would say two, um, but you need a harem of kind of 10 around you just to, just to tell you when it's a crap idea and to move on. Um, do you know, it's been fascinating, even when you've clearly not known the answer. <laughs> uh, a big round of applause for Dino. Thank you. Thank you. And we're right. back, everybody, at four o'clock with mind. BBC Advertising. It's going to be popular, so do get here early to avoid disappointment. And we'll see you in just a bit. Thank you so much for your questions. Well done.